curse those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and I will bless those Shalom for some time I've been hearing a teaching that the word which is translated blessed in Genesis 12, 3, could also be translated as grafted in. This teaching supposedly comes from the Talmud. Breshit Yud Bet Pasuk Shalosh, Genesis 12, 3. Va'avarcha mevarchecha, and I will bless the ones blessing you. Umikalelcha aor, and the one cursing you, I will curse. Benivrachu vacha, and in you will be blessed, call Mishpachot Adama, all the families of the earth. It's pretty clear from the people who are teaching this that they have not any understanding of the Hebrew grammar and the concept of the binyan. It's as if something gets a nun in the front and a, and a vowel at the end, and suddenly we have to revert to Paleo-Hebrew to understand the true meaning, and actually there's a very simple grammatical explanation for the way the verb is conjugated in the verse. To help you understand what's going on, we are going to have to get our feet wet in Hebrew grammar, but since you're going to be learning it sooner or later, you might as well start now. The concept of binyan is unique to Hebrew, Akkadian, and Aramaic. The simplest explanation that I could give is that the root word can be changed by the addition of some specific consonants and some vowels, and this changes the strength of the meaning of that root. For example, it's very clear that conceptually the words learn and teach are the same. I have taught uh, English as a second language and somebody will bring their friend for lessons and they will come in and say, oh, I learned my friend a little English. Well, now the question is, who needs the English lessons? What they mean is, I taught them a little English. In Hebrew, both those words come from the same root. In the pa'al or in the kal binyan, in the simple binyan, lamad, lamad mem dalad, means to learn. And the PL, if we change the vowels to limed, that means to teach. Here's a chart of the binyanim, of the binyans, and um, we're going to see it again, but you might want to print it out. It might be helpful for you to have as we continue in the discussion. There are seven binyanim in modern Hebrew, and they were carried from the biblical Hebrew. The binyanim are the same in both, uh, both forms of the language, the old and the new. One thing that we need to discuss before we can go on is a different grammatical concept, and that is the difference between active and passive. It's difficult for us to see the passive in English, and I will show you why. If I say, I wrote the book, this is an active sentence. I am the subject of the sentence. I am doing the action writing the book. I wrote the book. This is an active sentence. In the passive sentence, the book was written by me. The book is not doing any action. The book is receiving the action, and that's a passive sentence. What makes it difficult is that we cannot just look at the word written and say, oh, that's passive, because I have another sentence. I have written the book. This is an active sentence. It's a different verb tense, but I am still the subject of the sentence, and I have still done the action. I have written the book as an active sentence. The book was written by me as passive. So we can't just look at the form written and say active or passive. However, in Hebrew, we can do that. We can see by the grammatical formation, is the word active or is it passive? So we have seven binyanim in Hebrew. There are three active, which you see in the left-hand column and three passive that relate to the active ones. And then at the bottom, there's one reflexive. 
So we're going to take a verb that maybe you already know, a root, shamar, shin, mem, race. You can see it highlighted. And we're going to see what that looks like in an active, in a active form, in a pa'al, and then we're going to look at it in the relative passive form, which is the nifal. So this is the pa'al or the kal. This is Malachim Aleph, Yud Aleph, Pasuk Eser, First Kings eleven ten. Vitziva elav al hadavar hazeh, and he commanded him about this thing. Levilti lechet, to be without going or don't go. Achare Elohim achirim, after other gods. Velo shamar et asher tziva yehoba. But he did not guard or keep that which Yahweh commanded. So the verb shamar, these three letters, mean to guard or to keep. And this is from Solomon's downfall after running after many wives and concubines and foreign gods. And God upbraids him. And he never really repented from that. And he did not keep that which Yahweh had commanded him. So this is a pa'al, it's a simple form, it's an active form, he did not keep. Who? Solomon. Solomon is doing the action, or he's not doing the action, of guarding or keeping the commandments. In Mizmor Lamed Zion, Pasuk Esrim Shmona, Psalm 37, 28, Ki Ohev Mishpat, Yahweh loves justice, below Ya'azov et chasidav. He will not abandon his saints. Nishmaru la olam. They will be preserved forever. Vezera rishaim nichrat. And the seed of the wicked is cut off. You can see inside the nishmaru that there, the root there, shin mem resh. But now we have it in a nifal. The nun at the beginning tells us that it's nifal, which means it's passive. The vav at the end tells us that it's plural. The passive means that the people who are the subject of the sentence, who are the chasidav, the saints, right before it, are receiving the action. They're not doing the action. They're receiving the action. They are being kept. They are being guarded. They are being preserved. Who is doing that action? Yahweh is doing that action, but they receive that action. It's nifal, it's passive. We can also see that the nichrat, you might know the verb karat, means to cut and or, or cut off. And this is uh, in the singular for the seed. The zera, the seed, will be cut off, nichrat. So these are passive, they're receiving the action. We can see that in form, the Nishmaru of the psalm we just looked at and the Nivrachu of the They Will Be Blessed in Genesis 12.3, it's exactly the same form. The Nun makes the Nifal and the Vav at the end makes it plural. The Nishmaru is for the saints who are being guarded. The Nivrachu is for the Mishpachot, its plural families, which are being blessed. So I was very uh, confused and troubled about where this idea comes from, that this root, Barach, can be translated as grafted in. And nobody has ever given a citation for where they found this idea. I, I asked a knowledgeable friend, and he said, well, he thought it was in Baba Kama or Baba Metzia, one of the Talmudic tractates. And I searched, and, and I couldn't find it. So I... I uh, began searching all my Hebrew dictionaries, which are many in this house. And I began to look at this root, Beit Rish Kaf Barach. And uh, I checked every kind of Strong's and Jacenius and Wilson's and Hirsch and Jeff Benner's book. There was nothing, nothing about being grafted in. I, I went to my modern dictionaries, which I have four or five, and there's nothing under Barach that indicates that I would be finding anything about grafting in. 
I found every kind of uh, related word to bless and blessing, which actually comes from the idea of knees and kneeling, which is extended to the idea of kneeling over and drinking from a pond. A brecha can be a pond, and a bracha can be prosperity, but there was just nothing about being grafted in. And finally, I looked in the very last um, dictionary that I had in my house, which is just English to Hebrew. It was published in Tel Aviv in 1956, and I found this old English word, uh, which is graftage, not very commonly used, but I found two translations, havracha and harkava. You will notice that the three letters of the root for these words are anagrams of each other. And we're going to get back to that in a little bit. As soon as I saw the anagrams, I began to understand what is happening. I had also schlepped over to the university library and got the famous Klein's entomology book. And when I went back to it, I began to look under Havracha and Harkava. Klein specifically says that Havracha is a modern Hebrew word. It is a hephiel. If you go back to your chart, you find out that hephiel is a causative. In other words, Havracha means to cause to kneel. Not only does it mean to cause to kneel, but he includes it to the bending of a branch. So I began to see another idea. In uh, my 1300 page plus modern Hebrew dictionary, I found these two definitions. Again, a hephiel idea to cause someone to kneel or to cause some, something to kneel or replanting or transplanting. So this idea is different than grafting. There are certain plants, when you bend them in the stem and you plant them in the dirt, they will send out roots and they will become transplanted by themselves. Not every plant will do that. I think uh, roses are good at that, forsythia is good at that, maybe some other ones. So this is the real meaning of havracha, this root, barach, in the hephiel, it means to replant or transplant, to, to bend at the knee, at the bottom of the stem, expose the inside, put it in the dirt, and cause it to be planted there. I looked up the other word, harkava, and this is in fact a post-biblical Hebrew word. Um, it is in the Talmud, and this root, resh kaf bet, means to ride, to uh, ride on a donkey or a horse or a chariot. And again, Klein tells us it's the hephiel form to cause to ride. So he gives a definition of carrying on one's shoulders, but also the idea of grafting. And what we see in a legitimate graft, uh, that would be in a tree, a fruit tree or an olive tree, is that the branch which is being grafted on which is called the scion, is cut. And it might be even cut in a V shape. And it is grafted onto the mother plant, which is planted in the ground. And the two things are bound together so that the sap from the mother plant will run through the piece that's being grafted on. The graft is a riding. It's being caused to ride on the mother plant. And in the modern Hebrew dictionary, we see the same idea for harkava, to put together an assembly, a composition, or grafting. What happens when people get a hold of an idea like that is one person will put it on the internet and it just takes off like wildfire. The original author might really find this information for himself, or maybe they get it from hearsay. Whatever the source is never quoted, and everybody's just writing and writing, and nobody is researching, nobody is authenticating or validating the source. It is a kind of a teaching which tickles itching ears. When I first heard the teaching, I immediately emailed the Hebrew Aramaic professor here at the university, and I also emailed the Ask the Rabbi at the Chabad website. And both of them told me that they did not know 
of any such use where Barach meant grafted in. Well, recently somebody talked to me about it again, and so I searched again, and I found a website that had the integrity and published the Talmud citation for this usage. So the usage is in the Talmud, Tractate Sota, Folio 43a. The Hebrew I have uh, copied from the site mechonmamre.org. The English is from a site comeinhere.com, which has large portions of the English translation of the Sonsino Talmud. If we look at it uh, piece by piece, Echad Hanotea, we see that this is the it is all one, uh, whether he planted. In other words, Hanotea is the one who planted. The Echad Hamavrich. This is the he feel, as we were talking about, of the root Barach, which is normally translated as to bless. And we see here that it is translated as bent. The Echad Hamarkiv, which is the he feel of the root to ride. It's translated here as grafted. The Echad Halokeach, the one who it takes, or they have translated as purchased. The Echad Hayoresh, the one who inherits. The Echad Shenatan Lo Matana, or the one that someone has given him a present. The context here is Deuteronomy 20, verse 6, and the rabbis are discussing the exemptions for going to war. And there is an exemption for the person who has planted a vineyard. And they go on to expand on that and say whether he planted it or whether he bent it or whether he grafted it or whether he purchased it or inherited it or somebody gave, him to, gave it to him as a present, he's still exempt from going to war. There is a footnote there uh, on the word bent, and I have copied the footnote from the Sonsina translation. And it says, bent, that means the vine, so that the end is embedded in the soil and brings forth a new shoot. So this is exactly what I found according to the dictionary, and uh, it it uh, <laughs> it goes in the face of the teaching that it's grafted. Grafted has its own word, and this is a different kind of transplanting. But please don't be sad. I believe that this understanding brings a, a deeper dimension to the families of the earth who are blessed by faith through Abraham. It is not in opposition to what Paul wrote in Romans 11 about being grafted in. People are still grafted in. But we see that Ephraim is cast out to the ends of the earth. However, if he is bent, if he is caused to kneel, and he is broken, then he is planted. And in fact, he grows where he's planted. Those roots are shot out from the plant, and the plant can continue to bloom. I think it's relevant to this verse, Colossians 2.6. If ye have therefore received Messiah, Yeshua the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. By the way, the Delitz translation of the New Testament uh, uses the root, rakav, for the places in Romans 11, where Paul talks about being grafted in. And so this rakav is really the accepted root for being grafted in. It means to cause, to ride on, whereas the havracha, the barach, would be more accurately translated as transplanted or replanted instead of grafted. But wait, there's even more. I told you we would get back to this. There are three words that are all anagrams. Barach, which means to bless. Rachav, which means to ride. And Bachor, which means the firstborn. And the rabbis tie all these three words together because they're anagrams through the story of Joseph. Joseph was clearly blessed. He was the first one to ride in a chariot. And he was considered to be the firstborn. Reuben lost his place as firstborn for um, sleeping with his father's wife. And we see 
that Jacob gives Joseph an extra portion, which is the well in Samaria, which proves that he has received the double inheritance. He is the firstborn. We are indeed a blessed people. However, we come in to the faith. We ought to do our very best to not be spreading bubamysis and mixture in the world. We need to do our homework. There are many, many, many wonderful things that the Father has given for us. And uh, we have plenty of chance, access to resources to dig out the truth. Let's spread what is really true. In the meantime, to Simitai Naim al Hashemayim, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in of the earth will be blessed. God said to Moses,